So have you ever thought about how artificial intelligence might actually perceive time? Is actually a really deep question. The deeper you go into it, you'll realize that physics kind of has a notion of time, entropy has a notion of time. Subjectively, we have different notions of time and they don't all sort of fit together correctly. In fact, in the most fundamental levels of physics, time seems to be invariant, which leads physicists to think of time as something akin to something that's in a highly ordered state, sort of averaging out into a less ordered state. That's essentially what entropy is. But even that, with more questions than answers in itself, isn't even close to the way time's perceived in the mind. Like, your history of who you were might sort of be in order, although likely some things are actually out of order, you just don't recognize them that way, but you definitely can't just measure it with a clock. Like, in one sense, your memory is actually just constructed on the fly, in another sense, most of your memories are connected to emotional states, and the brain has all sorts of things that were actually just correlational that we feel like is causational because that's just what we learn to look for. So in this video, I just wanted to kind of play around with all these crazy notions of time. And it got me thinking about what does time feel like if I was inside of ChatGPT, like a large language model and neural network. And why is that so different from linear time and some of the other artificial intelligent attempts to try to figure out how time actually feels inside of one of these systems. So first, let's talk about recurrent neural networks. Now, this was an artificial intelligent model that was really catching on before Transformers. So this is not how ChatGPT works, but it was very hot and trendy right before that. RNNs are different than traditional neural networks because they use a loop mechanism. This allows the output of one step in the process to actually influence the next step. So it's kind of like a staircase where it's learning from each step that it was just on. And this solves some really interesting problems when it was first invented. But it turns out that even when you scale it up, it becomes extremely difficult to hold on to a lot of memory and especially accurate memories of the stuff that matters and the stuff that doesn't matter getting forgotten. This was technically known as the vanishing or the exploding gradient problem. It basically just means the network couldn't retain information for very long. But this video is about the, sort of the philosophy of time, I guess you'd say, like what's the subjective experience of time in a system like a recurrent neural network? And I would say this is really close to something that's sequential, like a tape recorder or a DVD or something where past experiences are influencing the current thought process. They embody this principle called temporal continuity. And that suggests that the present moment is actually a continuum of the past leading into the future. And one interesting thing about an artificial intelligence system that actually works this way is that you can actually kind of like look under the hood and start to understand why it is that the system's actually predicting what it's predicting into the future. And of course that instantly led to anybody who knew anything about these RNNs moving into the stock market. Like everybody wants to predict the price of a stock tomorrow. And I guess kind of lucky for us because Wall Street would have gone crazy with this tool. It didn't really work in any useful way. It makes some predictions that are super interesting in some facets, but it wasn't useful enough that it could actually predict the stock market. Unless someone out there is doing it and I just don't know about it, which is very possible. But it's good that you know about these RNNs, not because they're super useful or in play right now, but because they actually give us like a metaphorical viewpoint on how memory and history can influence current and future events in an artificial intelligence system. Like their design fundamentally raises some really intriguing questions about the roles and limitations in learning and decision making and reflecting upon how much past experience is actually needed to get into present actions to accurately predict the future or even the present. But now in modern AI systems, the transformer is the star of the show and it's essentially replaced every recurrent network that I've heard of recently. And they're like totally different. They're almost a complete 180. They do not process information in a sequential way. But yet you know things like ChatGPT accurately predict the order of words. They understand that some things in history happened before other things. There is a sense of time there. Where did that come from? Unlike the RNNs that we just talked about, transformers use something called the attention mechanisms. T is the T in chat GPT. And it allows them to process a large sequence of data simultaneously, so in parallel. So if you imagine like a sheet of paper with some text on it, instead of reading it left to right, it's like there's a line underneath the words and it just goes up. It processes them all at the same time. And it learns which words to give attention to and which words not to. But amazingly, this kind of a system does capture long range dependencies tendencies. And when it does this, it makes them incredibly good at understanding the order and the causal nature of the text. That's crazy. Like large language models can learn order without learning in order, if that makes sense. In fact, that ability to actually process in parallel really, really, really large things 
allows it to make really, really distant connections, really great long-term memory in a way that sequentially, like moving up that staircase, it would have just become bigger and bigger and bigger. You'd like, you're hauling that short-term memory up with you every single step. So from a philosophical point of view, that brings me to like a really interesting thought about like what is time or data processing or sequential information in a large language model? Because time isn't linear, it's holistic. It's like a giant entity and you can query it in certain ways which will have certain outcomes and that's where time kind of emerges on the output side of it, but it's not in there. Fundamentally, it's just not in the system. You know, and, and that aligns with some of the stuff that's usually considered a little more woo-woo, where time is like already this holistic thing that we all live in and everything in our past and future has already happened. And like time is relative, all the Einstein stuff. So it's very much like an unsolved mystery. And Transformers just emphasize that it's the contextual relationship that matters, not the actual sequence. And it makes me think like, if I wanna make really good long-term decisions or a company or a government wants to that, we should also kind of try to think probably a little bit more in parallel, like a really complex decision might need to be thought about at the same time with relationships being the priority, not sort of what, who did what and what happened and how do I react? Because even though in your outward world, you might have a timer in your kitchen that is ticking time away, realistically you are you because you're in your head and stuff in your head, if it's stored in a similar way to a neural network, then it's not stored in a time sequence. Even if you know what comes before other things, you're pulling that out of your own head on the fly in response to a question. You're analyzing the relationships, putting them together. Time is emerging in a way, I would say. Certainly things that you think about more have stronger connections. Things that you thought about when you were a child have stronger connections. So in some sense, they're older than newer things, but that's just because they're stronger. Well, then maybe people would think about things like productivity and leadership and the way we could construct companies and businesses and governments in ways where strategic planning and decision-making is actually thought of in terms of those relationships. And what I would take from that as an actionable is probably that we should be teaching context-based learning because that's the way it probably is in our head instead of sequential or rote memory where you're like, memorizing step by step how to do something. And I don't know, maybe if some people started thinking about that, there'd be all sorts of other things that you could learn from it too. Maybe there's different ways to approach learning and reasoning and understanding and the way we teach in schools. I mean, if nothing else, it raises all sorts of profound philosophical questions about time and the way it's perceived. Now, I really wanna point you to this article that I found while researching this video. It was written by Megan Biadri, and it was written in Salon. It's called, A Brain Injury Removed My Ability to Perceive Time. Here's what it's like in a world without it. So this article is talking about a woman who's suffering from lupus cerebritis, which is a rare but very severe form of lupus that causes brain inflammation. Now, unfortunately, this condition drastically impaired her ability to move and think and remember. It was impacting her daily life as a career in professional music. It was messing up the order of the music, the understanding of timing and order. But there was a lot to really think about when they talked about the way that she started losing her perception of time and how that was connected to the way she was communicating. I mean, this got really bad, especially because it's in the brain and it's controlling so many other parts of the body, but she was bedridden and she was questioning whether or not she would ever regain her former cognitive abilities. Like, look at this. I forgot that my favorite color was red and either whether or not I liked yogurt. I no longer remember telling ghost stories around a campfire with my family. She started hallucinating fireworks in her bedroom. And because of short-term memory issues, she was repeating herself over and over again. That is when she even remembered enough of her vocabulary to actually speak. And then she talks about how being unaware of the passage of time felt like being trapped in a single chaotic moment that never ends. She had no way of knowing how long she'd been sick for. Like I've heard of people with Alzheimer's, how they, they sometimes like eat way too much if they're given too much food because you just, forget that you've eaten, so you just eat and eat and eat and not really understand that the signals aren't enough. She started to think about any event in her life, whether it was like a few hours, a day, or 15 years ago, as if it happened a long time ago. And then it said right here that the study revealed that the brain makes sense of time as an event that was experienced, but the network does not explicitly encode time into that memory. Now, in contrast to like sequential learning or data, it does seem like the brain wants to remember things in order. Like there is a connection to the way things happen, but you don't necessarily need 
exactly time in there. And that makes me think it is more like a cluster or a connection that goes from like big, medium to small, but not so much like tick, 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 second by second or minute by minute. Anyways, I mean, I encourage you to go read it on your own, but the point is that it explains a lot about how there's no single area of the brain that's responsible for any one function and that our memory, our sense of time is a collaborative process that seems to come from many regions of the brain. So for her, disrupting time is kind of like disrupting the whole brain. Like when you lose time, you kind of lose it all. But luckily for this woman, her lupus is getting better. Time in general is coming back online along with all of her memories and understanding of herself. But luckily, her lupus is going away. Her sense of time is coming back online. Her and her doctors are even using tools like metronomes that tick, tick, tick to help her bring back all of that musical ability. And now it's time for you to hit that subscribe button. Help me get to my next goal of 8,000 subscribers.